Today and next week are Sundays on which the church around the globe focus on specific events in the life of our Lord Jesus. This week, being Palm Sunday, focuses on the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. Next week, being Easter, centers on the glorious resurrection of our Lord. Now, Palm Sunday is one of the most well-known events in the life of Christ. It is the beginning of the last week of the Lord's state of humiliation, that is, his humble birth, the entirety of his perfect life, his death, and his remaining under the power of death in the grave for three days. It is the day that Jesus rode toward Jerusalem for the last time. Now, if you were reading the entirety of the Gospel of Luke, this would have been in your mind because this trip, this final trip to Jerusalem, has been the expressed purpose of the book since chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 51 We read, when the days drew near for him, that is Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. His face was fixed, it was resolved, it was established toward going there. After saying that, three times he predicted his death in Jerusalem, and he constantly mentions that he is heading toward the city. It is the gravitational pull of the life of the Lord Jesus in these his final days. Everything that happens after this in Luke is along this track, along this trajectory, along this purpose. Jesus has to go to Jerusalem. Now last week, we saw how Herod's relationship with John the Baptist was complicated. In that, he both respected John the Baptist, he liked to hear him preach, but he also wanted him dead, which of course, as we saw last week, was done at his command in horrific fashion. Well, here again we see a complicated relationship, and it is between Jesus and the city of Jerusalem. Aloha, everyone. Jerusalem was the city conquered by David, and he made it his capital. It says in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Jerusalem was the center of God's plan for the nation of Israel. It was the capital. The temple was there. The presence of the glory of Yahweh was there. It was the place from which God's salvation and kingdom would flow to the ends of the earth. It was seen as being the spring, if you will, the staging point of God blessing all the nations with his reign, with his kingdom, with his presence. Psalms 14 and 53 both conclude in identical fashion with these words, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. But Jerusalem was also the center of the opposition of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Pharisees, the chief priests, and the scribes were there. We could say that this was their home base as well. In our passage today, at long last, after traveling and after poverty and messianic secrecy and teaching in parables, our Lord heads there as the revealed king of Israel. Jesus had been teaching for three years about the kingdom of God, his own kingdom, while living as a servant and performing miracles. But today... No more hiding. No more hiding who he was. Today we see Jesus, the Messiah. With that, I'd like to invite you to stand, wherever you are, for the reading of God's Word. I'll be reading Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 41 from the English Standard Version. Brothers and sisters, this is God's holy Word. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany... As the mount, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, 
the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? O Lord, by your Spirit, we pray that you would make our hearts ready. Lord, make our hearts ready to to know, to believe that we have a great need. And help our hearts be ready to know and to believe that you have provided for that very need. O Lord, we pray that you would speak for your servants are listening. Speak powerfully, speak effectively, speak to our greatest needs, speak Christ to us, we pray. It is in his name. Amen. Please have a seat. Our passage is set on Sunday. That is the first day of the week, and it is the first day of Passover week. Passover was the Jewish, uh, uh, was a feast, and during Passover, the Jewish people of the first century would look back at the Lord's deliverance from Egypt, and they would look forward to his ultimate deliverance through the coming of the Messiah. During Passover and the other feasts as well, the Israelites would sing certain types of songs. They would sing certain psalms. They are known as the Hallel Psalms. The word Hallel in Hebrew means praise. They are found in Psalm, uh, Psalms 113 through 118 in our Bibles. And during these times, there was a particular amount of unified hope as the Jews who had been dispersed all over the known world, all over the Roman Empire, would descend and ascend the hill of Jerusalem and celebrate together. So as we come to Palm Sunday, to the so-called triumphal entry, uh, we come to, to something significant, both in the life of Israel in that day and to the church ever since. This story is normally told in triumphant form. It is labeled the triumphal entry in all of our Bibles. But at the, end, at the very end of our passage, we see it is not a lasting triumph at all. It is but a vapor. The question is why? Why by the end of our passage is Jesus weeping? Well, it's because the people were rejoicing for shallow and fleeting reasons. And what I want us to consider together this morning is that in the cheering crowd, we see ourselves easily cheerful when Jesus' plan lines up with our needs as we see them to be, but quick to forget him when it doesn't. And friends, we want to, and for sure we need to, rejoice in Jesus in a deep and abiding manner. Shallowness will not do, not today, not any day. It is always true, but at a time like this in our world, when people are fearful, when we are tempted to be anxious as well, we want not a shallow faith, because a shallow faith is a useless faith. We want to rather rejoice in Jesus with a deep and true faith, a faith that is rooted in and fixed upon his great work for us on his cross and his resurrection from the dead. And so as we look at this passage together, we're going to ask three questions about the people who are rejoicing over Jesus as he rides toward Jerusalem. We're going to ask, who were they? Why were they rejoicing? And what were they missing? This is our outline. You'll find it on your worship guide, God willing. First, who rejoiced? Well, first we see that it was his own disciples who were rejoicing. They were those who had followed Jesus for years. And in verse 35, we read that they threw their cloaks on the colt. That is to say that they provided a makeshift saddle for him. So the disciples rejoiced, but also, we are told, the multitude rejoiced. All four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have this detail uh, in somewhat different fashion. In Mark, we are told that many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches, that leafy branches, that is palm branches, where we get Palm Sunday from. John says that it was a large crowd, but put all together, we see that it is, it is a mob who is rejoicing over Jesus. It was seemingly everybody. It was widespread. They heard, they saw, and they wanted more. 
In verse 36, we read that they spread their cloaks on the road. This served as a triumphal carpet. It is what you did when welcoming royalty. They are crying out praises to God, and by their actions, they are saying they believe Jesus to be a king. But more than their actions, we read from their words that they were saying something else. Please look at verse 38 with me again. The crowd said, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, this is uh, from the Old Testament. It is from Psalm 118. It is from a Passover, a Hallel Psalm. And they are, they are applying it to Jesus. This is significant because they are, by their words and by their actions, recognizing this Jesus, this man on that donkey, to be the Messiah, to be, to be king. And they were being obedient. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, in light of what they were saying, quoting from Psalm 118, and in light of this prophecy, this Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 prop, uh, prophecy, the crowd was saying, this is the Messiah. This is who we believe this man to be. This is the son of David. Now, I said a moment ago that it seemed like everybody was rejoicing, but there is one group who is not rejoicing, and that is the Pharisees. Look again at verses 39 and 40 with me. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now, the Pharisees were probably on the same pil pilgrim trail, the same road. They were heading to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. They see this mob incident of the people proclaiming this man, this poor man from Nazareth, what good can come from Nazareth, right? This poor man is being declared to be the Son of God, to be the promised Messiah of Israel. And they say, teacher, if you are true, tell them to be silent. And Jesus quotes this, uh, this very strange um, Pro, piece of prose, really. I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. It's an interesting thing to try to interpret. Some think it's kind of like hyperbole or a value statement on the Pharisees, as in the stones are more spiritually aware than you are. But I think it's more than that. You see, Jesus came to defeat sin's power over, over all things. The curse, the curse that God put on creation needed to be lifted, needed to be resolved, needed to be fixed. And so when the Messiah came, it was understood that what he came to do was not only to bring salvation to his people, but also upon the face of the earth. He came to bring what theologians call cosmic salvation. The prophets of the Old Testament personified nature to convey this. One place is in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 12, in which it says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. We read in the New Testament as well that the creation longs for its redemption. And this idea of the creation recognizing what God is doing, the uh, the pinnacle of human history, as it were, is reflected in uh, the movie The Lord of the Rings, which Tolkien went back and wrote a book on. If you remember, it's my little joke, if you remember that, uh, that the trees had formerly uh, walked around, they had talked, but they had long been silenced. But then they started to move again. The trees started to move and speak again because something big was about to happen. That is, the king was returning to his throne. It is as if Jesus is saying here, look, the creation is anticipating its true and promised redemption, and I am coming to accomplish that in Jerusalem. The center point of all history is about to take place. I am hiding myself no more. I am revealing myself as the Messiah, and even my general revelation, even nature, reflects it. So Jesus was entering Jerusalem at last, as her king, and the many rejoiced. But secondly, why 
did they rejoice? What was their reason for rejoicing? Let's look at each group together again. Well, first, we know that the disciples were rejoicing because their service was about to be rewarded. They were the closest to Jesus after all. Surely they would receive, when he came into his power, positions of honor, positions of authority. James and John, we know from Mark's gospel, had already petitioned to be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his glory. This is Mark chapter 10. James and John said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? I remember Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples that he was heading to Jerusalem and that he was heading to Jerusalem to be rejected and to die. He explained, that is, what his glory entailed. They saw only triumph. They saw, to use the Lord's words, no cup, no baptism. These are two metaphors for his death. They saw no cross. They saw only glory. The disciples like we do so many times, we're not taking seriously the suffering that the Lord appoints to prepare us for glory. Suffering precedes glory. They did not even think of it on that day. So that's why the disciples were rejoicing. Why were the multitudes rejoicing? Well, most likely it was because of their national circumstances. They were a conquered people And they were looking forward when the Messiah was revealed, when the Messiah came into his power, to be set free from their enslaved position. It's interesting to think we as a nation have only been in existence for less than 250 years. In the year 2026 will be our 250th anniversary, I believe, as a nation. Well, at that time, the people of Israel had been handed off from oppressor to oppressor for six years hundred years from Babylon to Persia to Greece to Rome they desired a king to set them free from their earthly oppression and in Jesus they saw their physical and political deliverance the pagan Gentiles would rule over them no more they saw physical freedom and so they rejoiced now we can relate to them can't we though we certainly would not say that we are enslaved During our quarantine, surely none of us would say that. We know that would be a reach. But we long for normalcy. We long for it. And how easy is it to view, to um, have the default view of our hearts be that salvation for us in these days is a return to normalcy, a return to work, to sports, to kids' activities, to being able to go to the beach without getting sighted, to a normal Costco parking lot, to a normal toilet paper supply, Salah. How easy is it to view normalcy as salvation and to place the focus of our hope on that? How easy it is, not just in this season, but in every season, to believe that our physical and temporary setting determines our peace, determines our comfort, determines our security, and so we direct the focus of our heart to those things. Lord, if you provide these, then I will feel at peace. In a a real way, that's what the crowd was doing on Palm Sunday. They viewed their political reality as being ultimate. They wanted a king who served them in that way. It's what they wanted. It's why they were rejoicing. But third and finally, what were they missing? What were they missing? What was the gap between true joy and what they were experiencing? Well, it's in the nature of Passover. It's history. It's purpose. It's lesson for us for all time. It's salvation. You see, Passover was about sacrifice. It was about, in its inception, what we call substitutionary atonement. The shedding of blood for one, of one, for the saving of blood for another. An animal's blood was shed over the doorpost on the first Passover so that the blood of the firstborn of Israel would not be shed. Exodus 12, 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you. 
Blood in the Old Testament was a result of sin. Blood represented life, and it was a trigger in the minds of Israelites to think of sin, of, of their sin, and the sin of the world, how a holy God hates sin and how he deals with it. It is easy to conclude that this crowd who was rejoicing had nothing of this in their praises of Jesus as entering and heading toward Jerusalem. There was nothing made of sin, only joy. In uh, the book of James, chapter 5, there is a, there's a connection between sickness and the need for repentance and forgiveness. James 5.15 says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. We are living in a period of time, of course, when we look around and see and hear of a pandemic of sicknesses and at the very least, we see widespread cultural brokenness. Now, there is a, there is a massive abuse in some circles in telling, um, telling someone or some group of people that a specific illness befalls them because of a specific sin against God. Uh, no one knows this but God, and to claim to know it is at the very least taking God's name in vain. We hear people saying that God is punishing people for a certain sin with a certain sickness or plague, and the coronavirus is no exception. I've heard already false teachers do it, and I'm sure there will be more who do it. This is why we are going through this period of sickness. It's because we've done this, but of course we do not have such knowledge, not yet, as the old hymn God moves in mysterious ways, puts it, blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. So we can't look at what we're going through right now and say this is as a result of this sin that is wrong, that is presumptuous, that is in error, that is speaking for God. But, but, generally speaking, when we are physically weak, when we are surrounded by weaknesses, by sicknesses, we should be keen to recognize our spiritual frailty and our need for God's mercy. In sickness, think about it, God is giving us a vivid and personal illustration of humanity's finiteness in comparison to God's infiniteness. All sickness, after all, is a result of sin, right? Right? All deterioration and weaknesses are because man rebelled against God and is under his curse. Sickness was not a part of God's creation, but it is as a result of his curse upon creation. And we are to, when we feel sick and weak, to feel the weight of sin, sin in the world and our own sin. And the answer to that is to go to our God seeking Mercy, it is, I say, an opportunity for us, all of you, Trinity Church, Central Oahu, in this time of weakness and sickness, this is an opportunity for us to look internally on where we are putting our hope rather than in what Christ has done for us. It is a gift for us to repent, okay? And we, we naturally feel this when we're sick, don't we? Maybe you felt this during the quarantine. I'm worthless I'm pitiful, I can't do anything, right? Well, in one sense, yeah, you are, as am I. We are jars of clay, we are earthen vessels, we are easily broken, we are so very weak. In these times, friends, let us think much of our sin so that we would think much of grace. The rejoicing crowd on the original Palm Sunday was not thinking of their sin either. They're rejoicing was a shallow rejoicing. Because though Jesus entered as a king of peace, there was still a battle to be fought, wasn't there? See, in the ancient Near East, after a battle, a king would return to the capital city riding his war horse. It was a procession of military triumph. That is how the king re-entered the city. But on this day, Jesus came on the maiden voyage of a donkey, a animal that could never be useful in battle, and he came before the great battle. 
See, the battle was not between God and the earthly oppressors of God's people. It was not between God and Rome. The battle that Jesus was going to fight was between a holy God and his beloved people's sins. His people could not fight it and survive. They could not pay for their own sins with their own blood and live. But King Jesus could and King Jesus would. He entered Jerusalem as the true king who would be bruised for the sin that you and I commit. And so he would earn victory over our sin. Jesus was entering Jerusalem to win a battle uh, with the weaponry of his body and blood, and he won. Jesus defeated death by dying himself. He became the Passover lamb, and so the wrath of God passed over his people, and they are saved. But in our passage, the people did not see it. They did not want it. See what happens at the end of the passage, verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. Our Lord Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Why? Well, he knew their hearts. Their rejoicing did not fool him. Jesus knew theirs and our real need, a king who could subdue our hearts and provide peace with God. And he knew they did not want that. He knew what another crowd of Jerusalem would do to him come week's end. They would beg Pilate to release a murderer to them rather than Jesus, whom they cried, crucify, crucify. And so our passage does not end happily or triumphantly. But we're going to conclude with this. This is the hope of the gospel. This is our peace today and every day. Jesus Christ did not go to his cross because he saw a group of worthy people who he could come and repay for their true rejoicing. But rather, Jesus saw a world of sinners who needed a Savior. While we were still weak, you see, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The good news at the end of Palm Sunday is that people... Though they rejoiced over the wrong, for the wrong reasons, the people still saw Jesus pass by and head to Jerusalem to do battle with our sin. The people's selfishness and shallowness, his own disciples' shallowness, did not make him change his mind on dying for them. In fact, it displayed why he had to go. It is a processional to the cross of Christ, not to his throne that it was surrounded by hypocritical and shallow praise is actually most appropriate, isn't it? Because Jesus went to the cross for a real reason. His people really were sinners, and he really would die for them, for you, for me. And this is your hope today and every day, that Jesus is the one who rides into the city who would reject him in order to secure her salvation. He is the one who sees all of your sin, all of your rebellion, all of your faults, and who died for you. Not for the potential he sees in you, but for the love he has for you. At the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, The return of the Lord Jesus is described. The battle by that point has already taken place. Sin has been defeated and removed from existence forever at the last day. Do you remember what happens as the crown of the whole thing? The Apostle John wrote, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You see... Though Jesus' earthly relationship with with Jerusalem was complicated, the eternal relationship he has with her will not be. It will be one of Savior and redeemed people, of bridegroom and bride, washed clean in the blood of the bridegroom. That city will be all those who cling to him in repentant faith. There will be none who are left behind for the victory that Christ has won is so complete. And this is the hope we have as we approach the celebration of Easter and as we approach the coming of the new Jerusalem. Not that we have chosen to cheer when we saw Jesus coming, but though all of us would turn away from him in our sin, he went to the cross outside the city gate of Jerusalem and would bring true salvation. 
This is our hope as we remain in our homes this week, friends. It is It is our hope when we are allowed to leave. It is our hope every day, come wind, come weather. It is the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is yours. Turn to him, hide in him what a Savior he is. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we confess to you that we do so oftentimes rejoice and experience joy when we feel things are going our way. We confess to you, Lord, that so often we look at you through the lens of our own emotions, through the lens of our own experiences, through the lens of our own comfort. But Lord, we do not rest on our own experiences. We do not rest in our own emotions. Lord, we rest rather in you and your great work for us. Oh Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you went obediently for us, fighting the battle we could not fight in order to earn and to win our salvation. O Lord, refresh us by this gospel. Hold us tight by your grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.